Right, welcome everybody. Nobody there, yeah? Hmm. No, just us. Oh, there we go. Right, welcome everybody. Come on in. Welcome everyone to this uh, terrific evening we're going to have talking about Western Australia tonight. So, welcome. Uh, don't be shy, do start. Oh, somebody's already come into the chat room. Hello from Bedford to Chris. So, uh, yes, do feel free to use the chat and say hello. And uh, come on in. This is uh, Lynn from Wanderlust here. And uh, we'll just give a few minutes for everybody to get in and then we can talk about what's happening tonight and introduce our speakers. So, um, look, people coming in from all over the place. We've got Oxford, Kent, Milton Keynes, <laughs> Cornwall, Edinburgh, Sutton Coldfield. Hello, Finsbury Park, soggy Glasgow. It's always soggy in Glasgow, isn't it? I shouldn't say that. And we've got Yorkshire, Derbyshire. Yeah, come on in. People from all over the country joining us tonight. Bedfordshire, Chippenham. Uh, somebody from Portugal. Welcome, Barbara from Portugal. Uh, Malmesbury, oh, should have been in Western Australia in May. Oh, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Somebody from Toronto, welcome Marianne, and welcome to Sarah from Austria. No kangaroos in Austria, yes, you'd be a bit worried if there were. And uh, right, we've got Telford, we've got Winslow, Leeds, see, all around the world, as you can see, Monty. People from <laughs> Hanover in Germany, Bedfordshire, Brighton. Washington, D.C., welcome, Dorothy. You've been having an interesting time, haven't you, the last couple of weeks? Um, right, hello from Bromley, from Adam, Durham. Um, right, and Italy. Welcome, Marco, from Italy. New Malden, Christchurch. I presume that's Christchurch in Hampshire rather than Christchurch in New Zealand, but we never know with this lot. <laughs> uh, Dame, Herbertshire. Leicestershire, sorry, there's far too many people now. I, I see we've got already got nearly 500 people on. Uh, hello from a train from London to Kent. <laughs> oh gosh, is there anybody else on the train? Uh, that's going to be interesting. Welcome to Marlene from Belgium and uh, somebody else from Italy, from Veneto. Sorry, I just, that went by too fast. We've got West Sussex. Um, somebody else, David, said he should be in Western Australia right now. Oh, this is going to be cruel, isn't it, tonight? This is going to be heartbreaking. And uh, Robert Janet from Washington, UK, they've pointed out. Yes, but we have got somebody on here from Washington, D.C. as well. Maryland, USA. So, um, yeah, from near and far. Somebody from Norway. Hi, Nina from Norway. We've got Cornelia from Berlin. Welcome. Somebody from Reading. Right, let's, um, as we're waiting to start, let's do a quick poll. So, um, how many of you have been to Western Australia before? If you can see the poll come up, it really helps us speakers to know uh, whether people have been in before. So, um, yeah, so I think at the moment it's coming out that nearly half of you have been in Australia, but. Um, but only perhaps half of those have uh, been to Western Australia. So, um, oh no, is it half to Western Australia? Yeah, but and then another, well, that's actually really good. So it is changing all the time, so we'll see. See, about 44% have been to Western Australia already. That's incredible, that's uh, really impressive. Um, but there's another 34% who've been to Australia, but not to Western Australia. So good evening, everyone who's still coming in. We will be going live in a minute. Um, we've got Claire from Zeals, welcome. Somebody called Peter who went to Western Australia last year. I'm from London. Somebody who spent nearly two months in Western Australia in 2002. So a lot of affection and love here, I think, for Western Australia, which is what we like to hear. So, um, okay. Uh, I think most people are probably in by now, so we will kick live in a minute. So as I say, welcome. I'm Lynn Hughes. I'm the founder and editor of Wanderlust, and I'm really looking forward to this evening. I, I think it's going to be really special. And uh, tonight has been brought to you by Tourism Western Australia and by Trail Finders. And um, in a few minutes, I'll talk myself briefly about an area of Western Australia, the southwest, that I visited five years ago and fell in love with. 
So um, I'll just be talking for a few minutes about that. Yeah, keep your comments in the chat room about uh, whether you've been to Western Australia or not as well. That's all really useful to see. Anyway, after I've spoken for a few minutes, I'll then hand over to our main speaker for this evening, Monty Halls, of course, who will take us for a journey along the Coral Coast. And I've, I've seen his photos and videos, and they are incredible. Monty will then be followed by Phoebe Smith, who will be talking about the Kimberley in Shark Bay. Yeah, really looking forward to that. And we will then go to a Q&A with Monty, Phoebe, and with Emma, Emma Lund of Trail Finders, who's an expert on Australia. So um, do, while they're talking, everybody's talking, do feel free to use the chat function to ask your questions in advance and so that we're all set to answer them by the time you get to the Q&A. Uh, but first of all, to get us in the mood, we have a video of Western Australia. Have you been dreaming of getting away? Far away? Well, we know a place that will recharge your spirit. WA, Western Australia. A land where adventure awaits. Otherworldly adventures. Ancient adventures. Majestic, unfiltered adventures. Go on, turn waiting into planning. Western Australia, adventure awaits. Fantastic. So, first of all, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my last visit there. And let's just bring up a map of Western Australia. And of course, I think people who haven't been before don't always appreciate just how big Western Australia is. I mean, first time visitors get caught out by how big Australia is full stop. But also when you look at Western Australia and tonight was called the, uh, the wild side of Australia and side is the word because as you can see, it takes up a huge area. And so even people who've been to Western Australia have very often only been to a small part of it. So if we see Western Australia itself, um, we are obviously from Monty going to be hearing about the Coral Coast and then Phoebe's going to be taking us up into uh, the Kimberley and Shock Bay. But um, areas which I'm desperate to go to, I haven't been to yet, but quite, you know, a lot of people didn't actually think of Western Australia as having a southern coast. So I flew into Perth. It was my first time in Perth in uh, 25 years. And um, it, it was incredible to see how it had a modern city, but lots of character too. And um, very, very, very livable city, I would say. Um, lots of space and, and all that glorious coast and, um, you know, so much on its doorstep. But the reason I'd gone to on, on this trip, particular trip, uh, was to go and see nature and wildlife and do a bit of walking and go whale watching. And so I headed down to a place called Bremer Bay. And it is just a, a short internal flight, about 45 minutes down to Albany, or it would take about five or six hours to drive down there. And it's just got one place to stay. It calls itself a town, but the population is only 230 people. And um, so I was staying in the Brever Bay Inn, which is the focal point for the community. And it's, it's known for its beaches. It is a, a sort of holiday spot, but we weren't there in the main season. And so there were no other visitors. We didn't see anybody. And uh, this was just a few minutes walk from the, from the hotel. And, you know, this was an estuary um, because it, it's by the head of a river. And there was just so much bird life and, and kangaroos and wallabies everywhere. It's magical. But um, the reason why I was there when I was, it was in a March. And what has happened is in February and March, they have found that offshore, and it, it takes a good couple of hours to get out to the spot by boat, um, you get what is probably the world's largest congregation of killer whales, orcas. So they are there from January to March, but we were there kind of at the, at the end of the season. February is the main time to see them. And you go out, it's quite a long trip. It's, you're out for about eight hours on the water. It can be a bit choppy. I did get caught out. I hadn't taken seasickness tablets, but um, and in fact, the other people on, there were probably about 20 passengers and they were taking the Mickey out of the puny Brits 
who um, hadn't been prepared for this trip and uh, hadn't thought about seasickness. But it was still very much worth it. It was, they still don't know quite why you get this congregation. Um, there is something called the Bremer Canyon. It's very deep water and you get this just whole explosion of marine life as I say, from January to March, and it attracts all sorts of fish, it attracts all sorts of whales, it attracts great white sharks, um, absolutely incredible. But because it's attracting so much marine life, you also get the congregations of killer whales who come in. And apparently, a bit like safaris, you do, of course, occasionally see something a little bit gruesome, although it will obviously probably be under the water. Um, but most days or every day, they guarantee that you'll see whales of some sort. Uh, you'll most certainly be very unlucky not to see orcas. So although the day that we were there, they considered it to be not one of their best days, they were a bit disappointed for us, we did see three family groups of orcas. And this was um, one that got particularly close. So we probably saw something like third, well, maybe 20 to 30 orcas and um, three different family groups and uh, it was very very exciting obviously when we did see them and um, back on on land uh, we got to over the next few days explore the area a little bit more and it was just dazzlingly beautiful i mean i'm not normally a beach person or i should say I'm more of a person would walk on a beach rather than uh, lie on a beach and so this was my sort of place because it's got a Mediterranean climate and we were there in obviously what's there kind of going into autumn I guess and um, there were got beautiful breezes off off the sea and you just got these vast expanses everywhere of white sand beaches and nobody on them we hardly saw a soul <laughs> when we were there except for friendly locals and they really are friendly it's a very safe area People leave their houses unlocked, they leave their cars unlocked, and everybody got into conversation with us if we did meet anybody. So Bremer Canyon, as I say, was this incredible area out at sea, which is still being investigated, and uh, scientists are trying to understand more about it, what exactly it is, why it attracts all this marine life. And then on shore, you've also got a biosphere reserve there, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, and um, it's a really sort of ancient landscape and it's known for its wildflowers and its rare plants and it is absolutely stunningly beautiful and um, this is us in the national park there um, the other people are, are people i was with there were five of us there and we again you know we had the national park to ourselves we didn't see anybody else we, we just had a guide from the park and I think it's this particular bay that each year attracts southern right whales into it. Now, we weren't there at the right time for them. The southern right whales are there, I think it's from May to October, that they migrate along this coast. And during that time, this bay is a bit of a nursery for mother uh, whales with their babies, the southern right whales. So as and when I do go back, I would love to see that um, because it sounds absolutely incredible that you have these uh, huge whales hanging out in the bay. Um, this was probably one of the best known spots along the coast, it's called Elephant Rocks and we did actually see other people there but not many, uh, you know, maybe three and um, really beautiful. And I hadn't appreciated till I got went there that there is a, a, a one of you know the, probably the best long distance walking trails that you get in the world, and it's called I can never pronounce it right. It, no, they know it the Bib, the Biblum Track, and it's a thousand kilometres long. It runs from near to Perth, from the Perth Hills, all the way down to Albany. And as I say, a thousand kilometers, it would take you six to eight weeks to walk it all the way through as a through walk, which some people do. And our guide there uh, runs a walking company that specializes in particular in the trail. And here he is here. And um, he actually walked the trail himself a few years before we were there. 
and it changed him and his wife's lives. You know, they, they were just so blown away from it that they decided to give up their jobs and start a walking company instead. And it is beautiful. It's going along the coast most of the way. And again, hardly anybody on it. We met one other walker on it. And this is the sort of scenery as well that you see, you know, uh, we were going through a forested bit, but every now and then we would come out onto areas like this with yet another white deserted beach. Absolutely beautiful. And then we just finished off back in Albany. The, the towns and villages there were, were very attractive, I've got to say. Um, small, friendly, independent shops. And I must admit, I did find myself looking in estate agent's windows. <laughs> it was, I just thought, oh gosh, you know, I'm sure all of you have been to places in the world and thought, could I live here or not? And this was somewhere that definitely stole a little bit of my heart. I, I absolutely loved it. So that's a, a really short insight into the Southwest, just to give a flavour of it, because as I say, not many people do uh, from the UK do seem to know whether uh, about that part of the world, or they might have been to Albany, but not along. So enough of me. Now, I'm probably going to be a bit embarrassed about my photographs because now we're going to hear from somebody who needs very little introduction. Uh, Monty Halls, of course, is a broadcaster, naturalist, marine biologist, and a traveler. He makes films, he takes fantastic photos. You'll have seen him on television, and uh, I'm sure that like me you love his work so Monty over to you please to take us up the coral coast hello everyone thank you very much for that Lynn and I hope everyone can uh, hear me and seeing me is not important because we're going to get stuck into the the presentation in a moment I have been a genuine fan of Western Australia my entire life and I only went last year for the first time when I was a little kid, I heard about this magical place called Ningaloo, where giants of the oceans gathered. And I just always wanted to go, but just never seemed to get around to it. Did a lot of traveling around Australia, never did Western Australia. And then last year, I got the opportunity to go. And they say you should never meet your heroes, don't they? You should never meet your heroes. They never live up to expectations. Well, Western Australia exceeded my expectations, which I hope I'm going to show you in the next 20 minutes because um, I've got 20 minutes to talk. So that's 20 minutes to describe 1,100 kilometers of the Coral Coast Highway, several world heritage sites and life altering encounters with wildlife. And I'm already two minutes into the thing. So, uh, right, here we go. Let's let's crack straight off. Um, I was very lucky when I flew out, uh, by the way, because uh, Singapore Airlines got in touch through Tourism WA said look would you mind awfully if um you could fly singapore airlines out there and would it be a real strain if you could uh, go business class so somehow i muddled my way to western australia and it was like being beamed to western australia only time i've ever done it i hasten to add so uh, it was blissful it was wonderful um so uh, is this the greatest road trip on earth well um if you love the sea, if you love wild open spaces, if you love extraordinary encounters with wildlife, if you love an ancient landscape with a deep, deep heritage, if you love big horizons, then this is the greatest road trip in the world. I think I really do. And uh, as you can see, that's the Coral Coast Highway. So it runs from Perth all the way up to uh, Exmouth there via a series of really extraordinary locations, national parks, um, a wonderful uh, bits of geology and wildlife encounters pretty much all the way up. What a, you know, a fantastic trip uh, to do. And every turn of the wheel, something happened. You know, there was something to see or something to do. So uh, we turned up in Perth. And we didn't have long to do it, I think we had about 10 days or so. What I'd recommend is actually doing it for a couple of weeks, you know, a little bit longer if you're going to do uh, this drive, even longer. It's um, We made some films for Tourism uh, Western Australia. This is Rich Davis, who's the cameraman I work with. And I've been to all sorts of places around the world with Rich. Um, you know, some really, really lovely uh, romantic locations. And I'm always there with this gigantic, hairy, bummed, tattooed man. Um, but uh, a great traveling companion. And happily, we were able to record our adventures and make a series of films as, as we travel. So Perth, let's start with Perth. I had one day in Perth. 
um uh, uh regina i think it is i'd recommend two weeks you know 10 days two weeks maybe even three weeks to do the drive um but uh yeah basically perth is one of the most remote cities in the world but do not let that put you off uh it's got about two million inhabitants it's got more millionaires per capita than any other city in the world it's the sunniest city in the world it's got the oldest uh, wine uh, 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 industry uh, in australia because it was built around the swan river so you've got the swan river uh, vineyards there it's uh, one of the happiest cities in the world and i was desperate to stay to spend a little bit longer what i did see of perth i really love this is cottesloe beach um it's the epitome i think of an australian city um and um has real heritage as well it was established in 1829 so it's got real heritage but has very much got its own character it kind of grew in isolation and is a very sort of arty uh, there's great calf culture there and um, i i really loved it it's one of the few places i've ever been that i thought straight away yeah i could i could live here i could definitely live here but um uh, one of the highlights uh, of perth is rotnest island which is about 20 kilometers off the shore um it's an extraordinary uh location for a number of reasons uh, but this is one of the the main ones um this is a quokka and it's called rotnest because when it was discovered by william de valinga in uh the 17th century he thought it's covered in rats so rat's nest rot nest actually it wasn't rats at all it was this little marsupial called a quokka um, very curious. They're known as the happiest mammal on earth and they love selfies. Uh, now, you shouldn't take selfies with them. I've been told to say that, but no one tells the quokkas that. So they've got this really enigmatic little smile. And But Rottnest itself has got beautiful beaches, a number of really lovely beaches. And it's, you know, generally, it's a pretty special part of the world, really. But it's worth visiting just to see that smile, I'd say. Uh, but anyway, um, we had to get going. We had to hit the Coral Coast Highway. And I remember chatting to uh, a local and I said, um, you know, might we get, is there a chance we get lost en route? And he said, mate, keep the blue thing to the left and the green thing to the right and you'll get to Exmouth. And that's an important point, actually, uh, because the highway itself is this beautiful ribbon of tarmac. You're traveling through wilderness. You're traveling through, uh, you know, really wild areas, but you're on this incredibly smooth road. So it's a very family friendly journey. And the other thing, it's in the Australian culture. If someone stops, people stop to see if they're OK. We'd stop to film and 50 cars had stopped. So you're right, mate. You sure you're all right? 100 percent. So you're not alone on that road at any point even though it is this great vast wilderness that you're traveling through um so uh, we headed north uh from perth and um we traveled through desert a lot of the time but from june through to september there's 800 species of wildflower in this region you get these staggering blooms it sort of works its way south as the year progresses so june it starts in the north and then works its way south through to september and you get these incredible fields of meadows of of wild flowers and uh, stunning vistas heading all the way to the horizon so it's not a colorless uh um landscape and um yeah interesting uh, western australia uh there's no garbage or litter on there that's very true it's immaculately uh clean but the first place we wanted to get to is about 200 kilometers north of perth so you know what's that a couple of hours three hours drive uh really and it's a place called the pinnacles and everyone had said to me you've got to see the pinnacles uh, it's in the namberg uh park there and um it's a series of extraordinary limestone monoliths and interestingly when we first turned up there we saw the initial part of it we saw a few of them and i was like well it's kind of okay but you know i wouldn't go mad and then we went around the corner and we saw this extraordinary vista and one of the feelings you get as you drive up the coral coast highway is this feeling of antiquity you are moving through a truly ancient landscape and that's not just in geological terms you're moving through a landscape that's got the oldest continuous culture living in it in, 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 on planet Earth, basically. You're moving through an Aboriginal landscape of uh, indigenous people who've lived here for 60,000 years or so. And you feel that antiquity. And um, 
this uh, uh, area of, of the pinnacles, up to four meters high, these limestone monoliths, incredibly eerie and very, very beautiful place. And I rather liked it because limestone is obviously um, uh, sort of solidified uh, shells and uh, carboniferous uh, uh, shells from uh, from the sea. And it struck me as the perfect place that represent Western Australia, that combination of the sea and the land. And the Uart tribe that, that used to uh, live here, well, still do live here, of course. Artifacts have been found from 6,000 years ago related to the Uart. Uh, people who live here. Um, it's said that these are the uh, these are their enemies that they fought in battle and uh, are frozen in in time essentially. And as we were leaving, the moon came up. That's the moon you can see in that shot, and it turned into this incredibly eerie, beautiful, spellbinding place. And one of the other uh, stories there is the Nyunga uh, people who lived here, and it was said to be a sacred place for women. And if a man wandered into this environment, he would be turned to stone. And these are the remnants of the men who wandered into that environment. So the Pinnacles was was wonderful. Now, a short drive away from the Pinnacles, we overnighted. And then a short drive away from the Pinnacles was something that everyone said, right, you, if you see the Pinnacles, you've got to see the pink lakes. And uh, we went to uh, a local um, uh, guide and uh, they took us to uh, there's some air tours uh, place and um, we overflew the pink lakes and I had a slightly surreal experience uh, there um, by the way as, as I was getting ready to board the aircraft this group of Chinese um, uh, ladies and gents came up to me and were like oh yeah we must have our photo taken with you so it turns out I'm big in China I had no idea you know I can walk down the main street of Bristol no one's got a clue who I am but I'm big in China just like the bloke to the right of me he's big in China as well but um, basically it's a short flight up the coast now, at the right time of year, as you glance out, glance out of the aircraft uh, window, you'll see humpback whales migrating down the coast as well. And then if you glance out of the other window, you see this, these bright pink lakes. Now, it's carotenid artery. Um, uh, it's carotenid um, algae, thank you, pardon, um, that uh, produces this, uh, it, you know, extraordinary color and it's used in dyes it's used in um, cosmetics it's used in all sorts of things and these lakes are one of the major sources of it in the world this utterly surreal pastel of different colors this palette of different colors so the deep deep blue and then this lovely ochre color and then the bright bright pink um so you know it's all in all it's quite a surreal couple of days you do the pinnacles then you do the pink lakes and so we thundered further north bear in mind i'm doing this whole thing in 20 minutes this is like a four-hour lecture basically we thundered further north and um went to the calbarry national park now the cal um barry park is based around the murchison river gorge these rocks are 400 million years old. Uh, there's a species of uh, wallaby that's been discovered here that was thought to be extinct, and it was discovered by a tourist. This is probably one of the most photographed views in the whole of uh, Western Australia. It's nature's window. So you come up and you get this beautiful view uh, of the gorge there through this truly ancient uh, uh, geological structure and strangely enough as you look at it you look down and just beside you is a perfect rock to put your camera on so they really do think of everything you know the geology has thought of everything as you look through nature's a uh, window and so many people have a window of the a picture of them just sat uh next to it and um one of the things that um and there we go there's the murchison river uh, gorge very family friendly and that's one of the things that struck me all the way across i just kept thinking i've got to bring my kids here and there's hikes you can do through the gorge, you know, moving through this ancient, unique landscape and seeing animals you're not really going to see anywhere else like the rock wallabies. Um, and I was really pleased to see as I was leaving, there was a family with the kids there. And these two kids were just agog at what they were seeing. It was almost too much to take in this immense gorge and that real antiquity starting to emerge that everyone we spoke to, all of the guides had a profound affection and deep knowledge of of the landscape and i had a kangaroo uh steak there which was absolutely delicious and extremely healthy kangaroo aren't endangered in any way shape or form i hasten to add and are oh, weirdly they're one of the hazards on the highways so you shouldn't drive at night as you drive up there because obviously kangaroos um a big old animal basically that bloke to the uh, left of me there um the classic aussie welcome you know the moment you walk through your door you get this classic 
Aussie welcome. And he was like, uh, you know, mate, because I was chatting about what a great trip it was, mate. Two states to be in, drunk or Western Australia. So he was a big fan, you know. Um, so uh, we thundered on and we thundered on to the Cape York Peninsula. The landscape starts to change a little bit. You get this exquisite kind of ochre coloured rock. And again, a really ancient uh, landscape, a really ancient place. And we were very fortunate that our guide there was a guy called Capesy. And uh, he's he's a local man. His ancestors have been walking this beach for 40,000 years and uh, that was quite a sort of deep experience quite a profound uh, experience and he welcomed us and he came up with this great expression he said you don't see nature you feel nature and at one point i glanced at my watch as we were going along and he said that's the last time i'm going to see you do that today and he got really quite grumpy about it he was like this is we, we don't look at watches out here i want you to immerse yourself in the landscape and he went off and caught some mussels for us and we cooked them up so that I think that connection with the people there was really, really important, really significant. And, and there he is, a great man, a great man, a great communicator. And uh, a little further up the beach, you've got Shell Beach. Shell Beach is one of the most sort of remarkable places. I've, I've been kind of weird places. <laughs> I've, I've been. It's um, five miles long and it's 10 metres deep. Oh, no, sorry, it's longer than that, actually. I think it's 30 miles long, but it's 10 metres deep. And it's white shells, the whole thing. And um, it creates this, uh, it almost looks like an optical illusion. It's so white, so dazzling. Um, and, um, you know, worth lingering. But we had somewhere we needed to be. And that was Shark Bay. Now, Shark Bay is um, a World Heritage Site. And quite right, uh, you know, quite right too. And one of the reasons it's a World Heritage Site is um, Monkey Mire. And Monkey Mire, if you look, we see the catamaran is moored next to that jetty. Um, uh, you can see there's a, a little bit of shallow water the other side of the jetty. Well, turning up there, regular as clockwork, um, every day is a pod of bottlenose dolphins. And that's 2,000 bottlenose dolphins in the whole area of Shark Bay and a, an array of other species as well. But this encounter is a really, really special encounter. And people come from all over the world to, to do it. Now, um, it's really important that encounters like this are, are controlled. This all started up in the 1960s when there was a fisherman and his wife started just giving uh, a few dolphins bits of fish. And then the dolphins started turning up. And every day they turn up. They're only fed 10 percent of what they would normally eat over the course of a day. And that means that they continue to feed. They continue to show natural behavior. And there's about a dozen dolphins that turn up and do this out of the 2000s. In, in the whole of Shark Bay. But it's a chance to interact with these animals, completely wild animals. And the adult dolphins will train up the young dolphins. Demu came and had a look in my uh, window and I realized that I would have to drive on. I was sitting still, I'd have to drive on because emus can't walk backwards. There you go. There's a little fact for you to take away from the, the webinar. And um, uh, so we moved up to Ningaloo. Now, Ningaloo is the largest fringing reef in the world. And what that means is there's a large lagoon, a large area of shallow water, which is home to all sorts of um, huge, iconic species, you know, charismatic, big animals that people go around the world to uh, to see. And um, so this was our our group and uh, our guides to get the old fella to get me in the water up up close and personal with a large animal and what do you know within about five minutes um we encountered man a manta now the manta is uh, got the highest mental functions of any of the sharks and raised 24 foot wingspan they wear a ton and a half they can swim at 21 knots if they want to disappear they can disappear and the operations out there are so slick. They have things like spotter planes. They make sure you have limited amount of time with the animals, that the animals are completely used to interacting with people. And it's under the animals terms, very much so. Now with this particular ray, we realized something rather strange was happening. And uh, the rather strange thing seems to be that it was coming up again and again and presenting itself to the wildlife guide, young lad called Jake, 
Now, Jake knew this Manta is a Manta called Freckles. Um, and uh, he suddenly realized that something was wrong. And what was wrong is that Freckles had um, hooks embedded in her eye, close to her eye. And she wanted Jake to get them out. And over an extraordinary 45 minutes, this Manta came up again and again. And Jake removed, in the end, removed the hooks. And we filmed the whole thing. And so the video I'm going to show you now is uh, the little film we made of it, which went around the world, became a viral sensation. But for me, epitomizes the outstanding relationship that the guides here have with the wildlife off the coast. So here we go. Closer and closer. And then she started to roll over and present. You could see she was trusting us because she was unrolling it and showing us the hooks. I went for a few dives down just to see how she'd react to us being close to her. And Jake uh, went down again and again and again and the animal didn't move away because I think the manta knew that Jake was trying to get the hooks out. I went down again just one last time just to you know, say goodbye and she actually stopped and just wait a bit. She understands what's just happened. Again and again, attempt after attempt, it was brilliant. That's one of the best things I've ever seen underwater. And that's a great quote from uh, Gandhi there to um, say that you know, the greatness of a people can, can be judged by the way they treat their animals. And, um, you know, I, th I think that's sort of epitomized by that encounter. I was very comfortable with these encounters because I felt they were so well handled by the guides and the animals were plainly so comfortable. So Ningaloo is 260 kilometers long as a reef and there's 500 fish species there. But between you and me, there's only one fish species that people really, really want to see there. And that's the whale shark. It's probably the premier place in the world to get in the water with whale sharks. You are pretty much guaranteed encounters. So uh, we headed out again. This was our, our team, our team of guides. Lovely to see, you know, young, enthusiastic biologists, conservationists, real expertise here and reverence for the animals. So, Essentially, the uh, whale sharks are feeding. They'll move along just nice and slow. Here's an animal that's, um, you know, 40 feet long, uh, weighs up to 20 tons. You know, it's um, a beer moth of the sea, can live up to 150 years, has been following these ancient pathways for a very, very long time. And you could see they were completely unfazed by the presence of people because it's so strictly regulated. You only get a few minutes with each whale shark, and then you have to leave uh, the waters. So um, uh, we had a fantastic encounter. We, we saw about six or seven whale sharks over the course of the day. Now I've seen whale sharks before and um, this for me was a glorious, glorious encounter, but you can't beat someone seeing a whale shark for the very first time. And this young lady here was our guide from Tourism WA and I was chatting to her. I said, oh, you must have done this hundreds of times. She said, no, first time I've ever done it. And it struck me as she came up at the end, I was like, only a whale shark can do that to a face. Only a whale shark. And, uh, you know, it was just such a once in a lifetime, overwhelming assault on her senses, uh, you know, sharing the water with this huge animal. So it was kind of a fitting end to, to our time. We had one last night in this amazing place called Sal Salis, which um, if you want a bit of true wilderness and, you know, but with all the luxuries of, of home and some, then Sal Salis was, I have very fond memories of Sal Salis. You only got one night there, but blimey, and it's right on the edge of the reef, as you can see. So you can step into this lagoon and snorkel and uh, see a real array of animals. So it was a really nice way for us to, to finish and sort of epitomizes uh, the place really. So, right. I'm going to show you a very quick 30 second video summarizing my trip um, and uh, then we will hand over. So here we uh, go. Um. There's always a sense There's of excitement, sense when, of you excitement start. when you start any journey. But this is a special one. This is the Coral Coast Highway, one of the greatest road trips on earth. If you're going to fly to Australia, you might as well do it at a start. I'm flying to Singapore Airlines, which I'm really excited about. You 
don't see nature, but you feel nature. There we go. Lovely. Um, so, uh, yeah, for me, lived up to expectations. So there we go. That's, that's me done. I shall hand over to Phoebe. Oh, well, first of all, Monty, though, before I introduce Phoebe, can I just say that was incredible. That was so good. And uh, I saw in the chat that some people, they knew about the story of, of Freckles the Manta Ray, but they hadn't appreciated that you were involved in that and uh, helping out there. And, and, and it, that was so moving. And to see that video, that I feel very privileged. Can I also say very quickly, because I know some people tonight have had connection issues. Uh, I, I don't know why whether it's conditions out there or whatever. Just to reassure people, we will be sending out a follow-up email to everybody who registered. It will have a link to a recording of tonight, so you'll be able to watch it, try it again um, when, you're, when your broadband's working better or whatever, and you'll be able to see the whole thing, including the videos. And we'll also include some of the questions and answers in there. I know some people have been asking already as well about place names. Any place names mentioned, we will also put in that email so that you'll have them. So um, just to reassure you, and uh, yes, you, you will be able to watch it again at your own leisure. So now for our next speaker. So Phoebe Smith, and Phoebe's an award-winning travel writer, photographer, presenter, broadcaster, and author. She's host of the monthly Wonder Woman podcast, a former editor of Wanderlust. She regularly writes for the national newspapers, is a correspondent for BBC Radio 4 from our own correspondent. She's also a sleep storyteller in residence, which, I mean, we, we could talk about that a lot in, in its own right, at Calm, because I think a lot of you will know Calm and an author of 10 books. Um, I mean, we all know Phoebe is a great overachiever, but uh, it's such a privilege to have Phoebe here tonight. And congratulations, Phoebe, because you're a new mum as well. So I don't know if we're going to uh, be able to see Phoebe at some point. But um, <laughs> Phoebe is uh, passionate about Western Australia. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Phoebe. Oh, thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, so it's funny to hear Monty talk actually about how long it took him to get to Western Australia because I actually had the privilege of living in Australia for a year um, back in 2007, 2008. Um, and, and again, like most people who first time in Australia, I didn't end up going to Western Australia. It just the very vastness of Australia makes you realize how far the East Coast is from the West Coast. But the people I'd spoken to that had been there really all seemed to have this look in their eyes of somewhere very special that they'd encountered. And I knew it was somewhere that one day I had to get to. And that time was two years ago. And I've been subsequent visits since. And I was actually supposed to be there around this time of the year, uh, this year before obviously COVID and everything happened. But um, I'm going to talk to you. I've got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to talk about two very special places that are very sort of different in their own ways to each other in Western Australia. And the first is shown by this picture that we've got here, which is of a place called Dirk Hartog Island. Now, I don't know how many of you had heard of Dirk Hartog before I've just mentioned it. I hadn't heard of it um, until um, they were talking in 2016 about a special initiative that was going on. So. Dirk Hartog Island is um, Western Australia's largest island and famously the last place to see the sunset in Australia. Um, and as you can see, this picture I took from uh, from the helicopter as I was actually leaving it. Uh, and this is the northern point. And this is actually um, the Cape where Dirk Hartog, who was a Dutch um, sailor, landed. He didn't actually realise what he'd found. He didn't realise he was the first uh, white man, basically European, to stumble upon Australia. And he did that when he was looking for a faster trade route um, to get to India. He just kind of stumbled upon it, thought, well, I better claim it, um, and, and didn't do much else until obviously many, many years later, um, more Europeans came and, 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 you know, went to various parts of the country. But Dirk Hartog Island is very special um, because not only can you see it's got this ru lovely rugged coastline, but it's actually got a really, um, really cool eco um, credential. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, the image of the only one accommodation um, on Dirk Hartog Island. So you can either take your own tent and camp, but numbers are limited, 
or you can stay in this wonderful lodge here. And this is owned by uh, Kieran and Tony Wardle, who have their families have lived on the islands um, for generations, and they used to sheep farm there. It was like a lot of places in Australia used for farming, and they they started to realise no, this isn't right. We 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 should do something different. We should really we've got something special here. Uh, uh, and what they did was they they invested in a very expensive program to basically destock the island to get rid of the cattle that live there um, and to get rid of more importantly the feral species. So we're talking mainly cats who had basically decimated the uh, the natives. That there were basically um, thirteen endemic species to the island to Dirk Hartog, and eleven of them. Um, got killed off by the feral species introduced so they decided they were going to rewild it um, and one of the things they did when they rewild it was um, on an island nearby they managed to breed um, this this wallaby that had died off and then reintroduce it once they finally got rid of all the cats um, around 2009 and it was funny because I was actually talking with Kieran and we were driving back from seeing this last sunset in uh, in Australia and um, if you turn over to the next slide you can see this is this wallaby this Rufus Hare wallaby um, and Kieran had said since it got reintroduced he'd only seen it once on the island and I told him how much I wanted to get a photograph of it and he said don't hold your breath because you're here for three days and I've lived here my my whole life and I've only seen it once and I was very fortunate that I actually managed to take this picture on the way back whilst having this conversation, uh, which shows some of the magic um, of Western Australia, I think, and the things that can happen. Uh, the next morning before I headed off, so I, I, I'd heard about this walk they'd introduced called Walking with the Whales. And when you're told something like that, you often think it's marketing speak that you, you get to walk with whales. Um, so I very, you know, kind of skeptically headed out, first of all, by boat to head to the start point of this walk. So it's a, you can either do it in two days or, or three days, this walk. And they take you to and from the, the the points of the walk each day. And obviously you go back to the lodge each night. And on the way, if you turn to the next slide, we saw um, in the water alongside our boat, um, dugongs, which um, I don't know if you've ever heard of manatees, um, but manatees um, are smaller cousins of the dugong who look a bit like, um, they look like someone once described them as a carry case you'd carry a, a seal in. Um, and they're really funny, funny creatures they fart a lot and um, they feed a lot um, and they come up uh, very curious to the top of the water a lot and I I couldn't believe we got to see them so already this place we're living up to and going beyond my expectations um, and so once I got dropped off on the sand to do the self-guided walk um, I, I was kind of blown away already and if you if you look at the next picture that that I got um, on self time this was me walking um, along the peninsula of the island so I started at one end and I was basically walking halfway down it and not only it was that ocean on both sides and I, I actually got in the water there was no one around I went for a wild swim in the water one side um, after I ate my lunch and then carried on walking up here and I kept thinking I'm not really going to see whales because that seems a little bit far-fetched that I can walk alongside the whales on land but as you can see by the cliff edge there um, I started to hear this noise and I started to see something out the corner of my eye and sure enough um, if you look at this next picture that I managed to get I was indeed walking with humpback whales alongside me. And this one I'm particularly proud of um, because it's a mother humpback with her calf. And of course, as we know from what Monty's been telling us, um, the whales migrate up past this island and uh, upon this whole coast the whole time at Sharp Bay. Um, and this this whole place is just opposite um, Monkey Maya and the place where most tourists go. This is a much more kind of exclusive feeling place. It's, you've got to make an effort to go there. You you can either fly there, you can take the ferry there, or you can drive, uh, which is a very long drive from Denham, which is the uh, the main town, which is the gateway to Monkey Maya, to go. And then you still have to get a passenger ferry over it. Um, but for me, for someone to be able to tell me I could go walking, with some whales, and I actually do it. Um, it was one of the best places that I've uh, I've ever been to, one of the best experiences I've had, and certainly one of the best hikes I've had. Um, now for something completely different. So that was my experience of Shark Bay. Um, 
The next thing I'm going to quickly talk about is another region which a lot of you may have heard of, especially if you've been or if you've done some research, which is called the Kimberley. And my idea was I, I flew into a place called Broome uh, and on the Broome, they, at Broome, they have the most incredible sunsets. In fact, the whole of Western Australia seems to be the place to go if you love a sunset as I do. And um, they have camel tours along the beach. So this picture, even though I say it myself, looks impressive, but honestly, anyone can get this picture because every single night, like clockwork, you get these camel rides. And my idea when I first went was that I was going to Broome and I was going to catch a boat and do what they call the Kimberley Coast. So this is going up the coastline of Western Australia um, and nipping inland to see some of the really completely wild and deserted beaches, um, seeing if I could spot any wildlife, look out for the sea life along the way. But of course, what happened um, was that um, that the first day I went and I took a flight over um, and we can see on the next slide one of the attractions of the coast, just to give you an idea um, of of what you'll see there, which is um, a, something called Horizontal Falls. So this gives you an idea of how verdant and green it is, which really hit me that I didn't expect it to be. And this is where the sea comes in through these clefts in the land. Uh, and basically, you can see from above, it looks like a waterfall, but going horizontally rather than vertically. Um, so I saw I, I saw this coast um, from the, from this flight over it. And then I got ready to board the boat and uh, there was a problem with the boat. And um, unfortunately, the hull had split on it. So I wasn't able to um, to go and do that. So I had to very quickly think of another way to see the, the Kimberley region. And so instead, um, uh, I, I decided to join an overland trip. Uh, so a group of 10 of us uh, in an overland vehicle to drive what they call the Kimberley or the, the Great Gibb River Road. Um, and if you see on the next slide, this will give you an indication of the, um, the kind of vehicle that we had. Um, and this beautiful, again, it's always for me, I'm always taking pictures at sunset because this is what really sort of stands out to me but there's a lot of river crossings it's kind of like unpaved roads it's a real back um experience and we were camping every night in swags and stopping at various places along the way and and there's so many things to see and it's replete in aboriginal history in wildlife in sweeping landscapes like this um the next slide shows you uh, something which is kind of a combination of boat both. So this is a tree um, called a bayub tree. Um, and this was actually called the prison bayub. And that's because it's absolutely huge. You can see a person to one side of it walking past the fence. That's how, to give you a bit of scale, how big the base of the tree was. And they did actually use this as a holding cell. Um, so it's kind of this nature with this colonial history with this Aboriginal history altogether. Um, and this was just one of the first stops when we we left Broome and basically headed north. Um, and then from that, it was just day after day of stopping and seeing just such amazing sights. So the next slide shows just one example of the gorges, um, which are all um, free and completely safe of crocodiles. I know people worry about that kind of thing when they've seen the movies or whatever, but no, everywhere along here, the signs up, it's, it's absolutely safe. And um, you can see some people there getting ready to jump in. It's warm and then, but the water's this really refreshing temperature. And this isn't even one of the best. This is just one of many that we saw along the way. And so we'd spend the nights out in the desert um, we'd go and find somewhere to cool down in in the daytime and then we'd go for a hike um, off the road and literally it would look like a bunch of cliffs and then you'd suddenly come across something like what this next slide shows which is um, cave paintings which have been there for you know thousands and thousands of years and depict such things such as um, uh, you know the animals that you could hunt there which obviously they left as messages to each other um, and on this particular one there was also a painting of um, a whale so someone there had definitely been to the coast and of course there's a lot of water when the time of year when you're driving across is um is is before the very wet season which obviously makes it impassable and because of that you get like i said this verdant green colors by the side of the road the next slide shows you just an example of this and um this is a jabiru bird which is a, a black neck stork um and this is just one of the many uh birds that you will see when you're driving along the uh, the gibb river road and um for me one of the highlights of it was because it was so unexpected in some way 
wear that I wouldn't have seen otherwise having gone by the coast was that the guide said the next day we were going to go to the, the Bungle Bungles or Punalula um, National Park. Um, so we arrived and when we arrived, the sun had already set. So the next slide showed sort of our setup and away from any light pollution, you get just the most incredible night sky, stars everywhere. Uh, you can lie back in your swag, which is a roll away comfortable bed and kind of watch the stars twinkling. Um, and the next day I knew I'd be able to get to see um, the Bunga Bungles, uh, which is next slide shows from the air uh, what this looks like. So we went on a hike among them and then I took a, a helicopter flight above them to see what looked like giant um, beehives, uh, which are natural rock formations. And for me, the, the the best thing about about Western Australia is just that wonderful um, unexpectedness that seems to greet you behind every corner. And I know Monty's talked about this from his road trip um, that you just it just blows your mind. You you may think you've done the research, you may think it's somewhere that you 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 know about or you've maybe seen a part of it. But even though I've been back a few times now, there's still so much more I'd want to see and um, if you haven't been yet, I urge you to go. And even if you have been, um, have a little think about going back because I certainly, for one, I'm going to go back there. Um, so I look forward to uh, to seeing where everyone ends up going. So thank you for listening to my, my talk about uh, Shark Bay and the Kimberley. I will hand you back over to Lynn. Oh, thank you, Fiji. Oh, gosh. I mean, oh, gosh. If people aren't inspired again after that. I mean, uh, as you know, I've wanted to go to the Kimberley for years, and, and, and that's just really given me that itch again. I mean, that looked terrific. Lots of love from your uh, Sunfoot set photo on the beach as well of uh, the camels. It's like everyone's blown away by that, uh, and also jealous of your whale encounter. So uh, that was incredible. And uh, so welcome back to Monty, and also welcome to to Emma Lund. Emma's uh, been working for Trail Finders for six years, where she's the senior destination manager for Australia. So it's Emma who's responsible for designing all their inspiring uh, trips across the region. And uh, having recently visited the Kimberley, she uh, is with Phoebe there on it, saying that it's one of the most beautiful and unique places in the world, which uh, I think we saw it was. So welcome, Emma. Hi, Hi everyone. Yeah. <laughs> So Emma, we've, as you as you've seen, we've got quite a few people on who have been to Western Australia, but probably, presumably, hoping to go back again. Um, but there's also, you know, over half the people haven't been to Western Australia before. So if somebody was talking to you for the first time, what would you suggest just for planning? How should they start? What should they be thinking of as regards time? What they can reasonably do? Um, well, obviously, it's a massive area to start with. So I think really think about what your interests are. You know, if you're going to be interested in marine life and you want to swim with whale sharks, um, I'd probably suggest looking at the Coral Coast. Or if you're really into your food and wine, then maybe the South Coast is better for you. I Like, like you said, I did go to the Kimberley for the first time um, last year. And that is just absolutely beautiful. And it's, it's really like wild outback Australia. So think about what's important to you, what you want to get out of your trip, and then go from there. Um, most of our itineraries are about 14 days plus in length, but we really can design anything for you. So it's much easier just to pick up the phone and give one of our consultants a call, and they can design the trip totally to your specifications. Mm, yeah, presumably funny what people are interested in, whether it's wildlife, wine. <laughs> Yeah. or anything else. But Monty, uh, a couple of people asked what time of year you were travelling there. That's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> because it was last year, which as we all know was several decades ago and another world entirely. I'm not sure I can remember. Um, <laughs> do you know who will know? Ellen will know. So it will come up on the comments in about 10 seconds time. <laughs> I think we were there about July. I think it was there or thereabouts uh, because we wanted to coincide with the whale shark season. Mm. So I think it, it may be a little bit later than that. But Ellen, as we speak, will be panicking and writing <laughs> at the same um, time. So Tourism WA will. Uh, <laughs> I think it was round about, round about then. But, you know, again, what, what I do know is um, at any time of year, you've got a reasonable chance of seeing. So we were a bit early for the humpback whale migration. 
mm. um, and uh, a little bit early for the flowers, for example. So as you know, as Phoebe alluded to, you know, there's all there's so many things to see at different times of year. But we were pretty focused. It was late May. There you go. <laughs> you um, but um, <laughs> but um, we were pretty focused on on the whale sharks. Really, we wanted this end of the trip at the whale sharks. So yeah, there we go. Late May, like I said. Yeah, <laughs> like you said in the first place, like you knew. And uh, I guess that's the thing. I mean, even like I said in my little bit about how um, different, yeah, well, obviously with whales, yeah, the migrations are at different times and uh, wildflowers, et cetera, at different times. So, again, Emma, if uh, somebody was going there for the first time, is there a particular time that you recommend? Or, again, is it based on what they're interested in? Yeah, I think as a general rule of thumb, if you're going north of Perth, you kind of want to visit in our summer time. Um, and actually, March kind of through to October, November time does work well because that's the dry season. And yeah. then if you were going to go south of Perth, I would think about visiting more in our winter months just to make the most of the lovely warm weather. Um, but it really is dependent, again, on what your interests are. For example, if you're interested in walking and maybe doing one of the great walks, which is the Cape to Cape track. Um, which is south of Perth, I'd suggest May. Um, and if you want to go and see swim with the whale sharks, for example, um, March to August is perfect timing. So what we'll do is on the follow-up email, we'll send out a bit of a nature calendar to make sure that you can get the best and choose the right time for you. Um, I Just to interject there as well, if anyone is interested, I went, um, when I was there last year, it was in July. Um, yeah. And there's a two-week window where you can actually see the, you can swim with the wildlife trifecta as I like to yes. call it. So I, I swam with the humpback whales, I swam with the um, whale shark and with the mantas on over a four day period. Um, oh. so if you want to sort of, <laughs> um, that is the time to go. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's my tip. <laughs> oh, repeat that again then. When was that, Phoebe? That was sort of end of July. You've, you've got July. a window when all the migrations kind of happen at the same time. Um, so yeah, July, end of July. Okay, brilliant. And uh, somebody's asked, is the Ningaloo safe for, uh, for children to snorkel in? I'll answer that one, 100%, 100%. And okay. uh, we heard some lovely, that's, I'm desperate to get back there with my kids, you know, because you've got that great thing of this extraordinary environment, this very vibrant reef and lagoon system, like I said, 500 species of fish. Uh, it's crystal clear water but very and very unusually you've got megafauna as well you've got big animals to see and it's snorkeling so it's super accessible and um you know you get the old tiger shark and things turning up but the operators we work with they say oh yeah well, we go in with the tigers we take tourists in with the tiger sharks you know they're not interested in people they're not interested in eating people and yeah. they told us a lovely story um they said they had a, a little kid on board with his parents and they said to the kid do you want to go in with the tiger shark and the kid was like yeah definitely you know because they're fearless aren't they little kids and they said to the parents okay well get ready and we can all go in and the parents were like we're not going in but he can go in <laughs> <laughs> oh great <laughs> um, but, um, you know it's it's so well controlled the interactions and everything it's a it's a very safe environment i can't think of a better place around the world to introduce kids to the marine environment i really yeah. can't then oh, wow. yeah then then that lagoon because you're yeah. going to see them, basically oh sounds incredible uh phoebe um as a vegetarian because i mean uh monty obviously mentioned eating kangaroo before <laughs> and i think australia sometimes still got a bit of a reputation for that uh how did you get on as a vegetarian um i found it incredible and i'm just to clarify i don't eat fish either i know i know vegetarians don't eat fish but some people say they are and they do um but i didn't and i didn't struggle at all the and that's another thing i think people think oh I'm really going to struggle unless I eat kangaroo and I'm going to eat all this kind of outback animal. Beef um, pie. <laughs> but, um, no, it was, I just sort of thought Perth was absolutely incredible, as you would imagine. It's so yeah. upcoming and, and it's, there's so many pop-ups everywhere. I, I ate 
too well in Perth, to be honest. Um, and then I almost hoped I wouldn't find food as easily elsewhere, so I would avoid putting on the pounds. But um, no, it was it was really good at the Eco Lodge on Dirk Hartog Island. Um, they they make everything for you from fresh. So as long as you give them advance notice that you have any dietary requirements, they they get everything coming in on on their ferry that they get from Denham to go across, and they load up their transport ferry. It's wonderful the way they they operate out there. It's a whole different way of planning ahead for meals you know they really have to plan ahead um and you know same same with the kimberley before you go um overland obviously it's not like there's loads of shops along the way so you there were 10 of us in this vehicle and anyone said what dietary requirements they had and we all put money into this sort of kitty and then did one big shop and just made sure there was enough uh stuff we could make that was vegetarian and um yeah it was I'm never at better, to be honest. <laughs> oh, gosh, another great endorsement. Uh, right, Emma, um, somebody, or at least two people have been asking about uh, motorhomes, camper vans, and uh, is that something that, you know, you, you can organise, obviously, and give any advice on? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we do road trips everywhere, all over Western Australia. Um, you don't need a four-wheel drive in most areas. Um, but we, you know, a motorhome is a great way to travel, especially up the coral coast. If you want to go all the way up and back, that's really quite an incredible journey. Um, and you can stop off at different stops on the way and on the way back. If you were going somewhere like, uh, the Kimberley and you're going to do the Gibb River Road as, um, Phoebe did, we do a fantastic four wheel drive. Um, mo it's kind of a four wheel drive motorhome hybrid. It's the Brit Safari four wheel drive land cruiser, which has a pop out tent. So if it does come to the point where you need to stop anywhere, you can and you can stay in some incredible campsites. Um, so, yeah, there's a real range of things we can do all over Western Australia. Yeah, oh, that sounds magic. Um, right. I don't know if anybody can answer this one. because It's a shopping question um, about the pearls in Broome. Of course, Broome up in the northwest is known for its pearls. Are they worth buying? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I do know that they're one of the most the most amazing pearls that you can buy anywhere in the world. And when I was up in Broome, you see all the shops. So I think if you're going to buy them, it's the place to do it. They, I think they actually had, uh, in one of the shops I went in, they had the biggest pearl ever found, ever. Um, yeah. Display there, and they're saying how expensive it would be. And, and I mean, it's fascinating to go to one of the shops and see how, how they get them. <laughs> like yeah. Was, yeah. A whole new world. But also um the history in Broome, you know, they don't mm. go away from the from the Aboriginal history and, and how they were used and exploited to, to dive for pearls. And you know, fair play to them. It like I said, it's right there for you to learn about. And the 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 area of Broome blew me away. Like walking around, I, I sort of thought, oh, it'd be in and out, there's not much to see. But I ended up spending three days there. And uh, I had something to do all the time. And again, incredible places to eat and some really nice craft beer as well, if anyone's into that. <laughs> well, <there's laughs> um, Emma, uh, what about organised trips there? Are there, you know, small group trips that people can join? Yeah, in the Kimberley. Uh, I probably, I don't know if this is Kimberley or Western Australia generally, but um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's loads of options. Um, one of our favourites for the Kimberley are APT tours um, for overland trips up there if you don't fancy driving yourself. Um, but yeah, there, there's, I mean, there's tons of options. Again, kind of depends what you're interested in, really. Yeah. OK, terrific. Um, somebody was asking about Albany that I mentioned. Is it an old gold town? It's actually the oldest town in Western Australia. It's older than Perth. And it started, I believe, as a military town. It was, yes, an old gold town, gateway to the gold town, and, and, that, and that architecture, yes, is, is very reminiscent of that era. It was an old, sadly, an old whaling town because of its position on the whaling migration mm -hmm. routes. And um, you, you can find out more about that there. So very sad times, and uh, there is, there is a, a whale museum to go and see. And, of course, it's also famous in Australia for its Anzac history. It's, it was the last place that the soldiers went from when they headed off in the First World War to Gallipoli and so on. And they have got the most brilliant centre there. In fact, fantastic to take kids to modern if you go again take your children down to the southwest to uh, Albany they've got one of the best museums probably in the world a really interactive one 
and uh, very emotional but you know children just absolutely love it and adults of course but uh, and, uh, the children there were just so engrossed in it um, what was the name of the Overland Company? It was ATT, wasn't it? You mentioned uh, ATT, uh, an excellent ATT, option well, the for ATT. the Kimberley. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But um, again, we'll be when we do the follow-up email. Just to stress again, I know some people left uh, early because, for instance, they've got connection um, problems, and we will be doing the follow-up email with the recording of tonight. And it will also have useful links in, including how to get hold of Emma and Trail Finders. <laughs> and um, it will also have the place names for tonight. We will pick the brains of Monty and Phoebe and, and make sure that all the places we've mentioned are in there. Um, lots of recommendations coming up about beer, of course. I think it's that time of night where everybody's hoping for a craft beer themselves. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Right. Any other questions? We are actually running out of time anyway. But I'm just seeing if there's anything else we should open straight away. Or um, Phoebe, Monty, Emma, anything that has struck you? Any little tip or words of wisdom you would do? And in fact, both Phoebe and Monty, I would love to know when you do get to go back to WA, where are you going to go? You'll go first. Um, After you, Phoebe. Um, <laughs> well, I seem to have picked up a habit when I go to Australia, which I tend to be going every year, bar this one, obviously. Um, and I keep trying to tick off as many of the great walks as I possibly can. And they have one in WA, which is the Cape to Cape. Um, mm -hmm. I really want to do that one because, of course, the great walks in Australia are not like um, sort of great walks in other countries. These ones are kind of, there's a real focus on really nice accommodation, really good and locally sourced food and drink provided and the guides are just some of the best i've ever had they're so passionate and so knowledgeable not just about the walk and the history but about the wildlife the the flora that you'll see um the the geology it, that it just blows me away so yeah cape to cape which is in further further down than where i've been before so yeah i, I feel like i've been perth and up and i need to go perth and down <laughs> oh wonderful I, I think yeah, I would do exactly the same trip again, but I'd take <laughs> I'd take longer. You know, that <laughs> thing. I had this constant thing. We touched on these incredible places. And with a filming schedule and you've got to get to the next, you know, we were like, okay, cheerio. It's been an amazing 36 hours in a potentially life-altering place, but we've got to go. And um, I'd do it with my kids and I'd take it two weeks, three weeks if I could, do a summer holidays or uh. something. I'm uh, really uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. is it? it's too big there's there's just so much to see like i said i've been like three times now and mm. i feel like i'm just scratching feel like i'm just scratching the surface and then you hear about another place it's yeah. it's definitely the place to go when you've got the longest bit of holiday that you can possibly squeeze stuff in and you'll still need longer <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it oh gosh i know i know i mean where are we going to get all this time from but <laughs> although of course i mean they reckon the big thing we're all going to become nomads aren't we and we're all going to be having workations where we work overseas so I mean, maybe we can all meet up in western australia next year and work there well, okay. down anywhere again i want it to be wa because yeah. <laughs> and there's lots of open space so yeah exactly perfect yeah good tip good tip <laughs> Emma, where do you go again where would you want to go oh i think after the chats this evening i i re I'd really love to do the whale shark swimming or like phoebe said i'd like to go in july and do the trifecta of the manta rays the whale sharks and the humpback whales that's my yeah. dream emma that the humpback was swimming with oh. her oh. yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah and you could hear them singing to each other you could hear oh. them calling to each other it oh, was I just the love that. thing. Yeah. It was a, we, it was like a part of them coming towards us. It was like a freight train coming towards us, and they just watched it. Yeah. It was just honestly, I yeah, I'd go do it all again. I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> Monty, yeah, that's, that must that's be, on my list. Yeah, Monty, that must be making you itch to go again. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's one of the few places in the world you're allowed to enter the water with humpbacks. You can do it in Tonga, you can do it. There's a couple of places, you know, uh, you can do it. Dominican Republic, you're allowed to do it. But, um, and there's a very strict rule. You're not allowed within 30 meters of them, but no one tells the humpbacks that. So uh, <laughs> they're curious, you know, they'll come and, 
And it's that wonderful thing that epitomizes the whole relationship up that stretch of coastline between the people and the animals is that the encounters are on the animal's terms. And that yeah. makes it um, so, so special, you know. So, yeah, yeah, oh, blimey. You know, again, the opportunity to get a little one in the water with a whale, you yeah. know, is like... Once well, in a lifetime. Yeah. That's the thing you mentioned, the, the, the guides and the, the captains of the ships there are so respectful of of the wildlife none of them will do anything that would risk that they're they're way more concerned about what's going to damage them um and and so that they follow the guidelines to the letter and they don't put too many people in the water and they're really fair with making sure everyone gets a, a go in the water but all follows the rules and to be honest they tell you do this try and swim to be able to see this everyone's just so gobsmacked when they put their head in the water and there's a whale looking at them and they realize how big they are that you just you just can't do anything you just throw <laughs> absolute like oh my god this is life affirming so uh have to go back again and try and do it a bit calmer i think <laughs> yeah absolutely um there's we do have to wind up in a minute i think somebody's asking about uh diving with the whale sharks but no you can snorkel with them can't you yeah. uh, yes. just about all of the encounters are snorkeling encounters mm. and quite frankly if you try and scuba with a whale shark or a, a whale there's every chance it'll you know that's more distressing for it it will just mm. it won't be interested yeah. and that's a nice thing that because that makes it very accessible for kids as well it's just exactly. snorting. you've got expert guides everything's incredibly controlled every encounter you feel totally safe so it's it's all snorkeling basically so the mantas yeah. as well don't forget the mantas you know the mant oh the mantas that yeah. that just Oh, I'm so emotional watching those mantis on Yeah, that was absolutely magical. I mean, what wonderful creatures. Okay, I'm afraid we are out of time. And a few, I know a few people have said they're hungry or they want to go and drink some Australian wine now. They're feeling so inspired. So um, thank you. Massive, massive thanks to Emma, to Phoebe and to Monty. That was absolutely brilliant. And as I say, everybody, look out for the follow-up where we'll be sending the recording out. And... Uh, yeah, let's all go to Western Australia. Amazing stuff. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah.